So welcome to this class uh, today on mathematics, critical thinking, truth and faith. Just as we begin, I might answer one of the questions that one of the students asked, and they said, is mathematics and science a method or is it a field that is being studied? My answer to that is that it is both a method and also a field of study. So we can use mathematics as a method in many areas of study, social science. In English, you could examine the number of times certain words are used. So maths is a method of study and a very interesting method in that there's an exactness and a beauty about maths as a method, but it's also a field of study and, and that's part of the challenge. Once you make it a field of study, do you disconnect it from the other subjects? And one of the challenges as teachers is to show that mathematics and science are relevant for all of the other subjects and all aspects of life. So let's begin with a Bible reading from Psalm 94. Take notice, senseless ones, um, foolish people, when will you become wise? So this is students who are not paying attention in maths. Um, does he who fashioned the ear not hear? Does he who formed the eye not see? And we could add, does he who's made numbers and mathematical relationships not um, understand these and see the beauty in those? Does he who disciplines not punish? Does he who teaches lack knowledge? The Lord knows all human plans. He knows that they are futile. Um, blessed is the one you discipline, the one you teach from your law. And today we're looking at the law of maths. And if you go too fast around the corner uh, or too fast in certain areas, you learn the laws of maths. Or if you claim to a certain height and don't observe gravity. Unless the Lord has given us help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death when I said my foot is slipping. Your unfailing love, Lord, support me. And so sometimes we need prayers like that when we don't know all the answers to maths tests. And then in verse 19, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Hopefully people learn some insights today to help overcome maths anxiety because people can get maths anxiety and the students you teach can have maths anxiety. And what we want to do today is to think about how can we make maths more interesting, more relevant? How can we make maths less, you've got to get the correct answer and more that um, there are various ways of doing things um, along uh, the way so that people have less anxiety, the people are well supported, um, but we don't over spoon feed. Uh, we do give support, but we know when to encourage the students to think for themselves. One prayer. You hold the whole of creation in your hands, O oh Lord, the vast and awesome universe to each tiny grain of sand. You're the creator of all time. You balance night and day within a mathematical framework, infinite and safe. And then the last part of the prayer, the legacy of forgiveness as you subtract our bad things and bad feelings. You work out the whole equation when Jesus bore our sins. The test has all been finished. Jesus rose again. Eternity is infinite. Heavenly life begins and we pray that we might see the relevance of maths Lord today in all areas of life and in our life and also in um, the lives of the students we teach and in the subject we teach. Amen. So the objectives today we're wanting to understand how maths can be used in critical thinking firstly we want to look at order and beauty in maths and how we use that in critical thinking but also how that relates to order and beauty in God, if, uh, as we believe that God made the world. And also we want to look at some real life examples, we want to help students to learn and also um, help them overcome anxieties such as maths anxiety. So why do we learn maths? Every year you seem to have to learn maths, even in prep you learn maths. And it's such a part of everything we do partly because it's important in every civilization. That is, there's buildings, there's engineering, 
Maths is actually used in 94% of jobs. You might just say, well, I'm just going to work in a coffee shop or something. You're still doing maths. Um, maths is important to living life well, the decisions we make, including finance. Maths also teaches us about what is true. So if you learn that $2 plus $2 makes $4, or if you give someone $5 and you're uh, paying $2, they give you $3 change, it shouldn't change. Some people cheat, but it shouldn't change. Maths is also beautiful. The patterns around us, um, we can measure them, construct them, and builders use maths all the time. Clothes designers use maths all the time. So maths is beautiful. G. H. Hardy said, the mathematician's patterns, like the painters or the poets, must be beautiful. And Aristotle said, the mathematical sciences particularly exhibit order, symmetry. They're the greatest forms of beautiful. Maths is also good. To know that 2 plus 2 equals 4 or 5 minus 2 equals 3 shows us that there's a goodness in the world that we are a part of. Um, and Johannes Kepler said, I was merely thinking God's thoughts after him. We astronomers are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, and it benefits us to be thoughtful, um, not of the glory of our minds, but rather of the glory of God. So Kepler um, felt that maths in the world pointed to God who makes the world. So the mission of maths is not only to teach and instruct so that students become wise, it's also to teach and instruct so that they learn the goodness and beauty of the world, which can point to the goodness and beauty of the architect who is God. Um, so Calvin and Hobbes, you know, he says, I don't think maths is a science. I think it's a religion. These equations are like miracles in that it takes a miracle to give an answer um, because we can't find them. No one can say how it happens. We just two and two, and then the teacher tells us more. The whole book of maths is full of things that have to be accepted on faith. It's religion. And in American public schools, you need to call a lawyer because there's actually a few maths books in the American public schools. Um, and so it's like prayer, isn't it, maths? So uh, maybe we should, some students would say, let's exclude maths from schools because it's religious. Um, as a math atheist, um, Calvin says, I think we should be excused from the pain of maths. Well, hopefully in today's class, we'll find that it's not all painful. Well-taught maths helps students develop and use a range of skills in thinking. Can I get a, a few of you? to tell me what are some areas in life that you use maths in? Chloe, what's an area that you would use maths in followed by Josie and Ruben? Chloe. Um, I use maths in budgeting for life. So yes. buying groceries and fuel and rent and bills and stuff. And what's the secret? Um, do, do you have a savings account or do you have a rule that you spend less than comes in? Or are you one of these people who gets an extra credit card to cover the debts on the existing credit card? What's your um, budgeting no. guideline? Uh, I don't possess a credit card. I have savings accounts, but I'm not yeah. very diligent with actually yeah. budgeting my money super well. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Josie, where do you use maths in everyday life? Um, probably mostly like in the sense of time, like scheduling certain amounts of time for things. And if you've got to catch a bus, of course, you would want to schedule time. If you want to be somewhere, you've got to schedule time. Um, these days I will sometimes go to Google and I'll put in leaving destination and it tells me 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And so there's lots of examples uh, there. Ruben, where do you use maths in everyday life? Um, I would say definitely covering with the time and money aspects of everything, but I guess also uh, just randomly, especially if my sister's doing maths for school or whatever these days, and it's always helping her out or it's always just the most random stuff that just pops up. 
I guess. Um, I would say in music, when I do music, technically, we're just doing a different form of math. So uh, a lot of it is yeah. subconscious, but yeah. Yeah. And so we see that um, for these reasons and because it's in so many areas of life and it flows into critical thinking, it's taught in every area of school. It teaches mm. students how to identify key elements in a question. So you can break down if you're purchasing a car, you can think about um, petrol consumption, you can think about interest payments, you can think about um, depreciation, whether it will um, go down in value. Um, Noah, if you were to buy a car, would you buy a brand new one for 40,000 or more that might lose value? Would you buy one that's a few years old or um, uh, repairs increase the older it is? Um, would you buy one that's 20 years old and put up with the repair costs? Would it would age and how do you use maths in that? Noah? And um, volume now. You're muted. There we go. Um, I, d I bought a car somewhat recently. And so what I was thinking is I don't have 40 grand to just drop on a car. So obviously I'm going to have to buy <clears throat> second hand. And so with doing that, I then had to look at, you know, how much did I want to spend? What is worth it? And then also value for money because not all car brands, I don't know, types of cars are created equal. Some run better than others. And then you also got to weigh up, you know, repairs and manufacturing and then, if the parts, for example, like Holden isn't made in Australia anymore. So if I need to get parts fixed for that car, it's going to be more expensive and then all that. So I just kind of, you know, got one of the Japanese cars because they know what they're doing. Yeah, and so good. Yeah. yeah, and then got second hand, but I'm happy yeah. with my car. Yeah, that was good. the things I had to weigh out. Yeah. So, so obviously yeah, we're using maths, as Ruben said, all the time. And as you said, now there. Um, even in our subconscious decision making. And so that's another reason why um, English and maths are both seen as fundamental subjects in school. They develop the ability to think using language and number, and they also promote uh, wisdom. Um, now, many people see maths as not having a purpose or no connection to real life, but what we're arguing today is that maths is in many areas of life. It quickens our minds, it helps us, um, deepens the way we think and it develops our mental capacities. Pascal said man's greatness lies in his power of thought. So maths touches on thought and Pascal said man is but a reed, that is we're feeble, we're like a piece of grass, but we're a thinking reed and it's the capacity to think and part of the capacity of think is to use maths and language. Um, and so um, this idea of using maths and language raises some very interesting uh, areas. Um, I want you to think now, um, I have an example of um, two plus two equals four. If a person thinks of two apples and then two more apples in their head, two plus two equals four. And then they type it into a computer and print it out. And then they print it out on 10 computer printers, giving 10 copies. And then they give it to 10 students. Which is more real? Can I get everyone to write down which is more real? The two plus two in the mind of the personal teacher who thinks of it and then types it out or writes it down. The two plus two printed in ink on the paper or the two plus two in the mind of the student who reads a copy of it or is there a two plus two even before it comes 
into the mind of the reader before it arrives in the mind of the reader, a truth out there in the universe. Um, the numbers are real concepts, abstract, but real, um, invisible, but real. Um, and let's ask a couple of people. Gabrielle, what are your thoughts? Which is the most real? I think it's an interesting question because no matter what, two plus two is always going to equal four. And that fact is always going to be true, whether it's in your mind or my mind or the mind of the student that I give the paper to. It doesn't matter what it is. It's always going to be a true and real statement. I agree that the numbers are real concepts and they do exist in the universe, but I don't think that two plus two equals four is any more true or real in your mind than it is in mine. Like they're the same fact and that's just what it is. Yeah, so good. Um, Jasmine, where do you think it's most real? And then Madeline. I'm going to be honest. I'm really confused by the question Sounds and I don't not. really know how to answer it. Yep, Madeline, your thoughts and then Aiden. I'm on the same page as Gabby, in my mind, your mind, anybody's mind, that it's just a statement of truth. Yeah, so it's a statement of truth. And, and so the truth exists. It's not just made up by my mind, do you think, Madeline? That's a great question. <laughs> I'm going to leave that for the next person to answer. Sounds good. Aiden, your thoughts? Um, I'm the same. Truth exists whether we acknowledge it or not. Yeah, so truth exists whether we acknowledge it. Oh, that, that is such a good answer. So if even if I'm a young child who doesn't acknowledge 2 plus 2 equals 4 and don't know it yet because I'm 2 years old or 3 years old, um, it exists independent of my knowledge of it. Um, yeah, so good. Um, and Stephanie, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think that if you don't have an understanding of what numbers are, then it doesn't really have much meaning. It's just a statement. So I guess that you have to have some sort of background knowledge to understand it. And that's true of the person who reads it. Mm. That is, the person who reads those bits of ink on paper, the background knowledge is in their mind. And it's in the mind of the reader. And so how does it get there? It gets there through teachers, etc. But where does it come from? Uh, ultimately, it has been argued by Plato that the 2 plus 2 equals 4 exists in heaven with God. And if God makes all things, then he creates these realities like canvas on which reality is painted. Maths is part of the reality that God is making. So Plato says God creates these realities. He also says this makes it very exciting. Because if you discover 2 plus 2 equals 4 as a three-year-old or four-year-old, you're actually discovering the fingerprints of God. You're discovering how God's constructed the world. And so Plato got very excited by this, and it motivated his interest in maths and philosophy. His student Aristotle was not convinced. Aristotle said, surely... It's in the mind um, of the person. That is, we just simply um, describe what is. And so these are the two different views. One's the theistic Plato view that numbers are partly um, co uh, connected to God who makes the world perfect, ordered, and beautiful. And then the other is people who think like Aristotle, 
because Aristotle said, it's what you see that counts. He was an empiricist. And we live, some of us, in an Aristotle-like world where people say in politics and economics, it's what you see that counts. However, if you see the ink, two plus two equals four, that ink can't think, that ink can't speak, that ink can't actually do the two plus two equals four. It only makes sense in the minds of us when we work with it. And some say that's evidence of God who has given us these absolute truths. And it's evidence that our minds are pre-prepared to engage with God's concepts. And one of those concepts is maths, another is beauty, another is music. Um, there are other God concepts that we can um, uh, work with, conscience um, and uh, also goodness uh, placed there by God, says Plato. And Aristotle says, hey, goodness is what you think and make up out of your human mind. It's what you observe. Um, so, Reuben, do you follow Plato more or are you a Aristotle realist, a, a sort of a Scottish realist or um, um, a, a realist? It's only what I can see that counts. Or are you willing to accept Plato's idea that the unseen realms of maths are real. Thoughts, Ruby? Yeah. yeah, I definitely lean towards uh, Plato because obviously we'll never be able to get a full understanding. There'll always be more that we don't know. And that just points to that there's something that we can't grasp. There's something outside of our circle. I think one of the readings said, um, stood out. Yeah, and Goodell um, um, points to that as um, uh, that famous um, uh, mathematician who uh, points out um, in his communications and chatting to Albert Einstein that um, uh, these truths are um, so real and interesting that they point to the mind of God. So that's one of the things that we're going to touch on today, and that can help people who are um, uh, Christians in a maths class. They may see value in it. It can help people who are looking for the um, fascinating uh, realities that are there in maths. So maths for students is not something they just construct or the teacher makes up. You're touching on eternal truths. Some people are quite excited by uh, UFOs and things, but maths is much, much more real than that. You can touch it every day. You can work with it. Maths can make you rich. If you can work out maths and buy a few shares or whatever in the stock market, you could be wealthy. Um, uh, maths can give you a job. If you can handle maths, you can get jobs in all sorts of places. So maths can be very, very useful and it can touch God. It can be used in worship as harmonizing with God and truth. And it's a chance to read some of the language of God. Rene Descartes claimed that God created laws of logic and mathematics and that two plus two equals four is true only because God has given us these realities. Um, he quotes the, the a verse, thou was ordered all things in number of weight. Isaac Newton was motivated by this to explore the world that was out there. And uh, he felt that he was um, touching on God's laws. That's what motivated and interested in him as uh, well. Uh, I've got a, another exercise for you here and um, in this exercise I'm going to give you about two seconds maybe three at the most to write down how many dots you see so here's an exercise, and then I'm going to ask you how you work out the number of dots. But first question, how many dots do you see? And then second question, work out the dots. They're coming up now. They're coming up. Two or three seconds. There we go. How many dots do you see? Quickly write it down. One, one thousand. 
two one thousand, three one thousand. Write it down. Now I'm going to ask you, how did you work out the number of dots, Madeline? How many dots, and how did you work it out? Ten dots. I counted them. How did you count them, though, Madeline? One at a time. <laughs> One at a time. You'll get a good job in a bank. That's my prophecy there. Um, Aiden, how did you work um, out the, the how many and how did you work it out? Uh, also 10 and I did three plus four plus three. Right, three plus four plus three. So uh, that's Aiden's method. Chloe, how many and how did you work it out? I also got 10 and I did two plus three plus three plus two. Now, who are we going to make the teacher? Two plus three plus two plus three. And then Shyla, how many and how did you work it out? Um, well, I my eyes went to the six in the middle and then I was like two on either side is four. So six plus four, friends of 10 is 10. Excellent. <laughs> friends of 10. Well, that's what I've always done in primary. Friends of 10, friends six of and ten. four, two and good. eight, five and five. <laughs> yeah. Stephanie, how did you work it out? Um, yeah, I did the three, four, three as well. Three, four, three. Yeah. And uh, then Gabrielle, how did you work it out? Um, well, it looked like there would be 12 because it was three rows of four. So I just went 12 minus two because there were two dots missing. Wow, 12 minus two. Um, now, the point we're trying to show here is that if we make any one of you a teacher and you teach this method, you will spoon feed the method. However, what we're trying to show is rather than spoon feeding a method, maths can be curiosity, it can be exploration, it can be using many methods. Gabrielle, what's the danger of spoon feeding so students come into prep and year one, they're curious, they're coming up with ideas. And yet from year one to year six and year seven to year 11, we tell them this is the method. And particularly if they're in an Asian country, we say, you must repeat the method. What's the danger of this spoon feeding approach, Gabrielle? If we're just giving kids the answers, we're not actually teaching them how to find it for themselves. And so like we can teach them how to take tests and we can teach them how to do something over and over again. But if we're not actually saying, you know, like asking them more questions and teaching them how to find the answers for themselves, that's not going to help them in their day to day life. And we're not actually doing our job as teachers. And it doesn't teach them to think, does it? It teaches them how to reproduce uh, they become like photocopiers. So we're training up photocopiers to reproduce answers, whereas the better method would be to start with curiosity like we did there and say, look, what are some different ways? And, and we've got different ways we've worked here. We've got grouping as a uh, method and, um, uh, and um, yeah, lots of different methods. Um, I know when I do 98 times uh, four, I uh, do 400 uh, minus eight, which equals um, 392. Anyone else do four, uh, 98 times four that way, hand up? How would you do 98 times four, Ruben? I would probably go nine times four times 10 uh, and then add eight times four. Yeah. So again, different ways of doing things. And in some ways, it's not wrong or right. They're just different ways of doing things. And so rather than spoon feeding, maths can be more interesting um, and it can be more effective education when we uh, encourage students to think about the question, to think about the problem, to work through possible methods. Did you know um, uh, I um, uh, visited a school in St. Leonard's in Tasmania 
and um, uh, there was a, a teacher who learned piano uh, there, and um, his uh, name was uh, Peter Sculthorpe. And um, the first time Peter Sculthorpe <coughs> um, went to a piano class at the primary school, um, he was so excited by being taught some of the notes on the piano, C, D, E, F. He went home and he started to write his own tunes. And when he went back to next week's piano lesson, he got the cane because he was meant to be practising the scales, not rising, uh, writing tunes. Anyway, Peter Sculthorpe went on to become one of Australia's great music composers. So he didn't listen to his teacher. He went on and continued to compose. But again, it reminds us that at times, teaching can force people to fit into a method rather than encourage um, students to discover their inner capacity, their inner ability, um, their inner ability to do things. Stephanie, what are, what are your thoughts on um, cookie cutter, forcing people to a method as opposed to um, including exploration and creativity and problem solving? What are your thoughts, Stephanie? Yeah, I um, definitely think that spoon feeding answers or that sort of thing is not beneficial to the student. Like they're just regurgitating information, um, but they can't, it's not applicable in any way to their lives. So I guess it's more important to teach them the method of thinking and, you know, finding information to put together like an argument or an answer. Um, because that can be quite, you know, um, it can cross a lot of different areas in their life and their schooling as well. So I think it's a lot more beneficial to do things that way. Yeah. And, and so we do need to teach students ways of doing things, but we need to combine that with creativity, as you say, Stephanie, and uh, as um that Gabriel also said, and others have said. So we need to mix together um, curiosity, uh, ways of uh, doing things together with um, uh, recognition that there are important ways of doing things. Here's a maths textbook. I don't know if any of you have uh, seen this maths uh, textbook. Um, this is um, uh, a maths, one of the first maths textbooks to collect all of the information together in one textbook. It was written 300 BC by Euclid in Greece, um, and it's been used every century since. It's perhaps the most um, uh, sold book in the world after the Bible in that um, this maths uh, textbook um, has a lot of uh, valuable insights into it. Um, and so it's a basic textbook. So it defines a point is that which has no dimensions, a line has no breadth, only length, and then a straight line um, is the shortest and evenly uh, point between points. So that's what Euclid defines in uh, geometry. And then when he comes to numbers, we have the definitions. And um, so a unit or a number, it's a whole, and then we can have parts of a unit or we can have multiples of a unit. And uh, then you can have prime units and you can have even numbers and odd numbers. So if you want a 300 year old maths text, uh, sorry, a 2,300 year old maths textbook, you can download this online. I also discovered a 2,000 year old medical textbook um, which you can also download uh, free online, which is Galen's uh, medical textbook, which was also used for thousands of years um, from the uh, Greek medical. I brought it home and showed my family and they weren't convinced that we should still use this medical textbook uh, today. But I, I found it a fascinating idea that some things don't change, like geometry and um, maths and other things do change, like uh, medicine. So we see here... Um, an example, and this is an example that was found um, in 1897, and it dates from about just after the time of Jesus from New Testament times. So that's a copy of uh, Euclid's Elements. 
and it still applies to today. Can I get everyone to write down now what are two or three things that have stood out to you from this class today where we have looked at maths, we've looked at how maths is important in um, uh, logic, um, and, and it's so important in logic because it um, is reliable. If you can um, count out the money, um, pay $5, paying for something that's uh, worth $3, then, um, uh, then that sort of uh, logic is uh, very useful. We've also looked at some of the, the ways it points to God and the things of God as well. Um, yeah, so Josie, what stood out to you and then Stephanie? Um, I was just going to say that um, I agree with it. Like it stood out to me that um, it points towards God. Um, but I was just thinking then, um, do you know how we're talking about the different ways of, I don't know how to mm. explain it, but um, how it's perceived differently? Do you think there would be some people that think like the idea of just because, like, I don't know how to explain it, my brain's not working at the moment, mm. um, but they just, even though that it can be proved they disagree with like the logic behind it yeah and i think this raises as you, uh, raising there josie some logic is better than others um some may be faster than others and so i think what we need to do is to encourage the exploration and then as well as that we need to also um say that there are some ways that are going to be better so using the exploration um, primary school teachers tell me that if you're going to do fractions, a great way to do fractions is with a cake and you can cut it into halves and quarters and in the end you eat the cake. Now, they're going to be different ways to understand it, but it's the exploration that's important. And then if you're going to do one half um, times one half, so a half of a half is a quarter, you could do that with a cake. So you could have a cake that could be cut a half of a half, um, but you would then uh, say that multiplying the bottom numbers together um, gives you one quarter. Um, so I think we need a combination of both. Stephanie, your thoughts on um, uh, what stood out to you in this first session? Um, I like the conversation we had around um, whether truth exists, whether or not you acknowledge it. I thought that was really interesting that even if you don't know it doesn't mean it's not true doesn't exist um and also there was a point that we went past quite quickly on the slide there but um about maths helping to develop how you think so um to find a solution you have to think of the coherent process so i think that that's probably one of the like an important part of the whole critical thinking is having a coherent process to get to your solution, I guess, logically reasoning things out. Um, and then the third thing was um, to mix curiosity with ways of doing things. I thought that was a good point. So there's some of the things that we can take home um, from this. And as you say in that um, point there, curiosity with ways of doing things, it combines a little bit of spoon feeding and we've got to get the balance uh, right, um, combines a bit of method, but it also combines um, curiosity, which is part of the learning as well. So let's take our break at the end of, uh, actually, we've still got um, a couple of minutes um, to go. So I might ask um, Gabrielle, um, what's uh, your thoughts on what stood out to you in this first session? Um, I just think like what I was saying before about the, two plus two equals four thing I think like truth is truth no matter what and it doesn't matter if it's in your head or it's in mine it is still real and it is still a fact and we can relate that to teaching and we can relate that to faith like you know you know that God is good and I know that God is good and if Stephanie doesn't know it doesn't change the fact that it's true not saying Steph doesn't know God's good I believe <laughs> that you have a strong faith but you know like 
yeah, what she was saying, truth exists whether you want to acknowledge it or not. Yeah, so good, so good. So uh, let's take a break there and then we'll um, uh, come back uh, after the break and uh, have a uh, look uh, further at uh, maths, truth, critical thinking and our Christian faith in God. Thank you. Thank you.